I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about Flexbox, CSS and SAS style guides, HTML frameworks, and more. Let's check it out. First up is a really cool blog post called Flexbox in the Real World. They now, talk... Nick, when, when you say Flexbox in the real world, do you mean like the real world, the TV show, and they have to use Flexbox in that job that they never show up to? That's... It's like, oh, no, it was, it was tech's fault. No, it's not. That's exactly what this blog post is not about. It describes how to use Flexbox in the best case scenario where you only need to support bleeding edge browsers. That sounds kind of dangerous, but that's the way they've described it. And it also describes how to support Flexbox in browsers that maybe don't support it just yet, such as Internet Explorer 8. So in the best case scenario, they provide some markup. In fact, they have a full demo page, which you can click and see right here. And you can look at the source to see how that all works. But uh, then further down the page here, they give a couple of code examples of what exactly you would need to do. So in this kind of outer div, you would put WebKit Flex and then display Flex as well, just below that. And that should support all of the cutting edge browsers that you would expect would support something super cool like Flexbox. And then inside of that, uh, in these divs here, they give a couple of uh, more properties that allow you to use Flexbox as well. However, uh, there's a couple of in-between scenarios where you could use uh, this tool called Auto Prefixer, which will help you support a couple of more browsers, and it will give you markup that looks like this. You certainly wouldn't want to have to write all of that yourself. The third scenario is if you have to support IE8, but it doesn't have to look quite as nice, you can go ahead and use Progressive Enhancement. However, if it does need to support I899, and it needs to look exactly the same, uh, you're basically out of luck, unfortunately. Uh, they give a couple of small workarounds uh, using a couple of uh, shims and things like that, but really it's kind of just a, a tough scenario, and you're better off using something else besides Flexbox. You know, it's, it's really interesting that we have polyfills and shims for so much other functionality except that, mm -hmm. you know, especially with Flexbox being such a useful feature. Well, it's just, yeah, it's just tough, but hopefully browsers will support it uh, in the future. Yeah, I mean, I guess the good news is they're working on it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's good news. Mm -hmm. Right, we can, you can take that to the bank. You can just try your best. That's the best you can do. That's, yeah. One day at a time. Change, uh, you just changed my life for the better, Nick. Next up, we have a blog post called My Current CSS and SAS Style Guide. Now, we've talked about style guides briefly here on the show before. Uh, a style guide is basically going to be something that your whole team can follow when coding your HTML, CSS, and or JavaScript. Now, in this particular blog post, uh, Hugo is talking about his CSS and SAS style guide. And that is going to be the naming conventions of the style guide and how exactly to put this all together. So if we look at the naming conventions, he goes through and, and talks about uh, something that he calls BEM, which is for Block Element Modifier, which he says is a clever and clean way to name your CSS classes, if he does say so himself. Um, but this is actually a, a pretty good way of going through and naming your CSS. So if we take a look at this, here is the block, which just starts out um, the whole block that you're gonna be working on. Then you'll use two dashes if you want to modify something in that block. If you're talking about an element beneath that block, do two underscores, and then continue on and so forth with dashes for modifiers and so on. And he even says below that, yes, double dashes and double underscores. We'll see why in a moment. So why is that? Well, uh, it's in cases where you're going to be taking a bunch of steps, you have a bunch of different directives with different elements, and things like that. So uh, there's also going to be naming conventions that he goes into, such as using blue or primary color. Uh, hey, you can even use both of them. Look at that. This is using SAS. We define the variable, and then we define it again, which is going to be easier to define later on. Now, 
defining something like, say, blue and primary color is going to be really good in an instance where, say, you're changing the color scheme of an application. Uh, just refer to the primary color or even change it later on. So there are a bunch more options here in the style guide from naming breakpoints, tabs versus spaces, always use two spaces. Basically, we're just going to declare that here. Anyway, uh, there's a lot more in depth if you take a look at the blog post. So check that out in the show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash go treehouse or search for us in iTunes. We are the Treehouse Show. Well, next up is XGIF or XGIF. If you want to say it incorrectly, yes, I, I mean, GIF. it is graphics interchange format, so I do feel like it should be pronounced GIF, but it's actually GIF according to the creator. Uh, that debate will never end. But XGIF is the, t the GIF tag that the internet deserves <laughs> but doesn't need right now, or they need it right now but they don't deserve it. I'm not sure. But... Basically, it allows you to do normal GIF playback, just like you would expect, or you can do ping pong playback, where it goes back and forth. You can also adjust the speed with a little slider here. Look at that. Whoa, GIF's in slow motion. What's happening? Or you can speed up playback. You can also sync GIFs to audio, and this has been a highly requested feature of the GIF format. Finally, we can watch moving pictures with sound on the internet. It's really amazing stuff. You can stop and start it, and you can even explode a GIF into its component frames, which is pretty nice if you're trying to debug it. You can view the source for this on GitHub. It is using web components, and you just have to import Polymer, then you import XGIF, and then you can enjoy the limitless GIF possibilities. Now, I was saying previously that XGIF is the tag that the internet deserves but doesn't need right now, or it needs it but doesn't deserve it. Well, there's a couple people that do actually think that we don't need another GIF format like this because the beauty of GIFs is that they work in places where images might otherwise work as well. So there's been a little bit of pushback on this project. In my opinion, I think it really depends on the specific context. You know, if you're using it in a place where it makes sense, then that's great. But if you're trying to support, you know, a ton of different browsers way back, then you might want to just rely on traditional GIFs. I have a large collection of animated GIFs that I like to send to people via text messages. Nice. Instead of using words. I'd like to see that sometime. You will. Next up, we have a project called Mix It Up. Uh, this is a really cool project that is a jQuery plugin that gives you animated filtering and sorting. Well, uh, what in the world does that mean? It, it's actually pretty cool. If we take a look at the demo right here, we'll, we'll take a look at that first and then, and then see what's going on. Here we have a bunch of different divs, as you can see, a bunch of, bunch of rectangles, and they've got different colors and different numbers. So right now it's sorted randomly. If we wanted to sort it in ascending order, whoa, look at that, we do that, everything just rearranges and it's, uh, it's all really smooth. Uh, we can also sort it in descending order, uh, filter by just these blue ones or the green ones or nothing at all. So why in the world would you want something like this? Well, go back to the GitHub page and it says it, says it all there. Um, mix it up plays nicely with your existing HTML and CSS, making it a great choice for responsive layouts. Um, <clears throat> it also uh, does these animations really smoothly, as you saw before. So it's super easy to use. You can use data attributes to give it order. Uh, you can filter it by categories, uh, CSS classes, and you can even sort it uh, where it has right there, my order ascending or descending. That's all the HTML that we needed to uh, see the demo back there. So anyway, this is a really, really awesome plugin. Um, could be really good for portfolio sites, things like that. Check it out. Very nice stuff. Well, next up is Bootflat, which is a UI toolkit for the popular Bootstrap front-end framework. Uh, basically, it provides you with a Photoshop document, which, you know, if you're a designer, you might want to go ahead and create your designs in Photoshop, and you have all of the uh, components there that you would need. But in addition to that, it's also a full uh, theme for Bootstrap. So if we scroll down here, we can get an idea of 
what this UI kit actually looks like. In fact, if we just go to the documentation, we can look at these in a little bit more detail. So as the name implies, it has a flat design or a flat theme, and there's all the different things that you get in Bootstrap, but just slightly restyled. So you have these nice colorful button groups. There's button dropdowns, labels, badges, popovers, tooltips, dropdowns, forms, and so much more. Not a whole lot to say about it, but if you are designing your website using the Bootstrap framework and you just want to get a theme in there really quick, maybe you're rapidly prototyping, this is a really great way to do that. Yeah, very very nice. I like the I like the name too, Boot Flat. Makes sense. Do you know if it's compatible with Bootstrap Foundation 5? I think it is. I mean, Bootstrap Foundation 5 is compatible with everything. Everything ever right. made. Yeah. Okay, good point. Hmm. Next up, we have a blog post on getting started with Grunticon. Grunticon is a nice plugin for the Grunt build system that makes it really easy to use icon fonts made of SVG files uh, embedded into CSS files. Whoa, that's so many acronyms and words, and what does it actually do? Uh, well, it's pretty easy to use. So um, what we do, let's check it out right here. We have a bunch of these SVG files. And if we want to make an icon set out of that, we're going to get these CSS files after we run it through the Grunticon uh, command. So uh, it'll also fall back to PNGs just in case the browser does not support SVG. Uh, once you do that, you can get the element uh, by using the icon dash whatever the file name was right there beforehand. So here we have div class equals icon dash bag. If we scroll back up here, we can see that there is a bag.svg in the SVGs folder. And then boom, you are good to go. Uh, once you have this all done, uh, it tells you how to set it up inside Grunt. Uh, once you have it all done, you can then go ahead and change these files using standard CSS. You can see right here they added a gray background and some rounded corners. So super easy to use project and a really nice alternative to icon fonts if you don't want to use those. Very nice. Well, next up is Grid List. And this project is actually pretty similar to Mixup in that you can rearrange different objects on the page and it does it all automatically. You don't have to worry about you know all the complex positioning that you would have to do. Uh, they have the, their project up on GitHub, but that's boring. Let's look at the demo. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop these boxes around. What what is happening? Is this, this, this magic? Is, this is amazing. Look at that. And all of these boxes rearrange just like you'd expect. You can even click on these one, two, and three X buttons to adjust the size of these boxes, and it all happens dynamically. And if you click these plus and minus buttons, you can actually zoom in or zoom out from the grid, and they, again, all rearrange just like you'd expect. So this is pretty handy. There's a lot of different types of websites that you could build with something like this. And it's actually really easy to add to your site. You can just use it as a jQuery plugin that's built on top of their agnostic grid list class. And it gives you a ton of options. Not going to go into the details here because it is pretty detailed. One thing to keep in mind is that there are other projects that do this. For example, Mixup is somewhat similar, might meet your needs just as effectively as this project. So be sure to look at both. There's another project called Gridster that was, I think, called gridster.js. And it uh, did a similar thing, but apparently it's no longer in active development. And it does have a couple of limitations that this project does not have. So definitely be sure to check that out. So you're saying if you don't want to use Grid, there's definitely other options to mix it up? That would be the case. Next up, we have a project called F7. Now, this is not the function key on your keyboard that we're talking about that generally does the rewind function. No, this is a fully featured HTML framework for building iOS 7 apps. And we can see it right here in the window on this page. So what in the world does this have? Well, this provides a bunch of different options for working with common iOS 7 elements. Uh, in this modal section, we can see, hey, here's an alert button. Okay, wow, this looks really just like 
iOS 7, and that is the whole point of this framework. Now, it supports, most, it supports most functionality that you would expect to see inside of iOS 7. So we've got tabs, media list, list views, just a ton of different things. Now, you might be wondering, hey, does this support you know, Android and things like that? Uh, it may or may not work on there, but the point of this particular framework is to let you rapidly prototype iOS 7 applications using just HTML and then closely mimicking the behavior. Uh, and for that, it does a really, really nice job. It gives you a lot of semantic classes, not a huge amount of markup, extra markup that you need to add to your HTML pages to get all that working. Like I said, it'd be great to use for prototyping functionality of an application. Very nice stuff. Well, that's all the time we have today. I am at NickRP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Cipher for show notes and more information on anything we talked about. Check out our show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse. Also, search for us on iTunes. We are The Treehouse Show. And speaking of Treehouse, if you'd like a free month of Treehouse, follow the links at the bottom of the show notes. Of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com and use that link to get a free month. Thanks so much for watching, and we will see you next week.